Welcome to Impre Web Policy Talk. I may request our moderator for today, Dr. Somedi, to proceed with the deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ritika. Uh, a very good evening from Kolkata. I am Dr. Somedi Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor at Vishwabharati University and a Senior Fellow at the Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. On behalf of the team of the Center for Habitat, Urban, and Regional Studies at Impre, I welcome you all to this City Conversation series. Uh, India is first urbanizing, and a large share of its urban population uh, lives in small and medium towns. Uh, in 2011, uh, three, 312 million people in India were living in the urban settlements, with a population between uh, 5,000 uh, and 1 lakh. And while only 265 million were enumerated in large cities and urban agglomerations, cities are viewed as engines of economic growth in India, and the small and medium towns are said to be affected by. In, in an unprecedented ways within this context of uh, economic liberalization and these heightened infrastructural activities and investment associated with it a cause for major concern in india is that uh, the coverage of basic urban services in small and medium towns has clearly been lower than any larger cities and also such deprivation is severe in least developed states of india the percentage of people living below the poverty lines increases systematically as one moves down in the size of towns both nationally and regionally poor quality of infrastructure and service delivery of these cities uh, have uh, has resulted in economic stagnation which undermines the potential of these cities whatever the scarce research available on small cities uh, these problems are generally attributed to poor finances lack of planning weak institutional capacities and the absence of effective governance structure and smaller cities have un- underused their limited taxing power and instruments simply because they do not have the manpower for for tax collection and smaller cities simply do not possess the institutional capacity to undertake urban planning in a comprehensive way and centralized bodies and the state agencies has different spatial scale influence the planning processes in smaller urban centers in a typical top down manner uh, and this rarely reflect as well as uh, serve the needs and priorities of the common people moreover in small and medium towns the perspective of uh, or, the, or the presence of informal institutions and practices become all the more important for the majority of the citizens to claim access to urban resources to shape the rules or to influence investment in physical and social infrastructure overall the development of small cities will be of uh, sort of paramount importance in ensuring sustainable urbanization in india unfortunately uh, in india development research and action often overlook the social political and economic dynamics of these smaller cities so it is important to look at the range of institutions individuals practices involved in the governance mechanism of small cities how such specificities and the specific uh social cultural practical historical context of those cities interact in 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 mutually transformative ways uh so keeping these all these things in background the center for habitat urban and regional cities at impri along with industra global and city makers mission international has launched a discussion series the state of cities uh, uh hashtag city conversations in this talk series we plan to engage with a uh, different urban experts Uh, to understand the challenges of urbanization and to search the processes or policies to make the cities cities sustainable and inclusive now today we are uh, very much honored as well as delighted to have with us dr andrew rombach uh, dr andrew rombach is an associate professor of the department of landscape architecture and urban planning at texas aman university his research centers on household and community risks to natural hazards and climate change in the united states and india Uh, using a mix of qualitative quantitative and geospatial data he examines the intersection of urbanization and extreme weather events and the political economic context for disaster risk creation and he has written extensively for uh, most of the reputed journals like journal of american planning association habitat international journal of urban affairs and the international journal of urban and regional research and as well as in edited volumes Dr. Rombach's current research projects include a longitudinal study of landslide and earthquake risk in rapidly urbanizing towns and villages in the Darjeeling Sikkim Himalayas and his research has been funded by grants from the National Science Foundation the Natural Hazard Centers the Rockefeller Foundation and the GOI Foundation among others uh, he is an active in numerous state and national efforts to 
help communicate build resilience to environmental hazards uh, through land use and historical preservation. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Ombach will speak on disaster beyond the city, urban development and environmental risk in the Eastern Himalayas. Uh, in today's presentation, based on a four year long study of Darjeeling district of West Bengal, he plans to discuss the rural urbanization and its special growth dynamic and challenging hazard context and governance capacity and their effects on environmental risk. So uh, once again, on behalf of Team MP, I welcome you, uh, Dr. Rambach. So it's over to you now. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, the warm introduction. I'll go right into my slides so that we have as much time as possible for discussion. Um, am I still sharing screen? Uh, no. Yeah. There we go. Now, yeah. There we go. Um, so thank you, and uh, you know, as as was said, I, this is a project. Today I'm going to present a slice of a project that I've been working on now for many years, um, and I'll point you to the publications where you can read more about the, the study. But it really focuses on this this important question of rural urbanization, which is a bit of a um, you know, it seems like a contradiction in terms, but I, I've come to think and, and believe as, as well as many of my, my scholar friends and colleagues, that this is one of the key urban development challenges facing India over the next 50 or 100 years. Um, and my own personal research agenda focuses on issues of disasters. Um, I'm especially interested in issues of catastrophic disasters that strike communities and how they mitigate against those hazards and how they recover in the long term. But really, when I think about my study of disasters, all I'm studying are normal development issues compressed into a very specific time and space. But really, we're talking about similar issues as any other development researchers, issues of fair and equal access to water and land resources. How do we make sure we can build housing and communities in safe ways? How do we protect against climate change? All of those are the kind of questions that drive my research in India. And so I think there's lots of connections with folks who may not study disasters specifically, but are concerned with the general state of cities in India and where they're going in the future. Um, so this is a, you know, a story that none of us need to see. India has a, a relatively small urban population, although that's disputed by some. Um, and it's gonna, the urban population is gonna grow dramatically over the next 50, 60, 70 years. So there's gonna be hundreds of millions of more people uh, in India living in cities than there are now uh, in 2050. And much of that growth, um, as the doctor just said, is gonna happen in uh, small places, small cities that are anywhere from you know, 50,000 to, to 2.5 lakh uh, population. And so, you know, in the urban studies and urban research scholarship, when we think of Indian cities, we're often thinking of cities like this, you know, Old Delhi, the sort of classic um, world famous examples, the global cities, huge population densities, huge economic activities, really interesting issues of, of uh, you know, access to resources and, and core development challenges. You could also think about Mumbai and think about, you know, famous slums like Dharavi. Um, but that's not necessarily what I think of when I think of Indian urbanization, at least in this study. Um, I'm thinking much more about those smaller places that I just mentioned. And this is a really useful graph from the, the IAHS, which, which used uh, data from the census and should be updated soon, hopefully with the new census coming out. Um, and so they're talking about, you know, they're looking at the actual overall share of the urban population in India and where population actually lives. And, you know, just to point out a couple features of this graph, and I'll make these slides available uh, to anyone afterwards, an enormous amount of the urban growth is actually going to happen in these um, class, you know, one, class two, class three cities over the next 50 years. And then what I find also very important is the growth of these towns um, and, and other kinds of, um, you know, statutory um, uh, uh, communities that don't even appear on the landscape of discussions about urbanization but are growing very, very rapidly and um, you know, will account for tens of millions of more people living in urban settlements um, by the end of the century, um, and yet are still described as rural and very much still governed as rural. And that's the focus of today's research is what's going on in these places, not even the smallest cities in India, but rather these fast growing villages and towns that have many of the features of urbanization, but are still treated as rural, at least institutionally within the Indian uh, urban development context. And so what are we talking about rural urbanizations? Well, we're talking about medium and large villages that were home to 
you know, 460 million people in 2011, and that's up from 79 million. So this is an enormous amount of the overall growth in population over the last 70 years has happened in these medium and large villages. And of course, these places could be anywhere up to tens of thousands of people living in these places. Um, and so this is a picture on the left. This is the village of Tista, which is you know very close to the, the site of the research for this project. And so you know anyone looking at this photo would describe this as an urban scene, right? We see the all the, the characteristics of urban. We see the density, we see the transportation, we see the utilities, we see the you know features of an urban place, and yet this is described as a village within the Indian census. And so this is the, this is and, and not just the census, but then you know other types of policies and programs that focus and, and classify places and, and direct resources as such. This is a village, even though its problems, in my view, are very much urban problems. Um, similarly, the number of census towns tripled from 2001 to 2011, and so that accounted for 30% of all urban growth actually happened in census towns. And so census towns are these places that are counted as urban in pop terms of population, but still governed as rural underneath, um, you know, India, again, different uh, policies in India. And then we also, so rather than just the pure growth, we also see really rapid in situ transformation of these rural places. And I'm sure everyone here who's in India or has visit, you know, has visited villages has noticed the same thing, right? We see a lot of the characteristics of cities coming into the villages. And so villages are no longer what they were originally imagined as um, back when, when a lot of these, these rules and, and um, procedures and administrations were, were developed, but rather have become um, quite a, a hybrid between city and village and have many of the characteristics of urban places. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but I just want to, you know, for later reference to say that, you know, in a very simple way, when we're talking about how urbanization is related to disaster risk, which is my main area of focus, um, it happens in two ways. First is that, you know, as cities grow um, spatially, more and more land that may be exposed to hazards um, becomes occupied by people or the things that they care about. So, um, you know, a city that's grown like in my case, in my cases that I'm going to talk about today, a city that's grown from a very stable uh, ridge top um, in the Himalayas that has started to build down the sides of the mountain suddenly has become much more exposed to landslide hazards as it expands. And then you also have vulnerability, which is this really um, you know, complex and, and we have to really unpack the term, but it's this idea that certain people, certain places, certain institutions, certain things are more susceptible to the damaging effect of a hazard than others. And so you also see this growing vulnerability among urban populations. And so, you know, on a very simple level, you put two people, two households next to one another. One has a lot of financial resources, has a lot of mobility, has a lot of connections and, and, and social and political capital. The other is low income, doesn't have a lot of savings, does not have great political connections. You would say that the first household is, is less vulnerable and the second one is more vulnerable should they both experience the same hazard. And so that's a really key piece of this is that disasters are not just about the earthquake or the landslide, they're also about the people and places that they affect. And we see stark inequalities in terms of how people experience hazards. Um, and so there's lots of ways that urbanization has been shown in the research literature to increase both exposure and vulnerability. And I'm gonna talk about some of those today without spending a lot of time on this slide. And so this is the, the research question that really drives um, the study I'm presenting today is how is India's urban transformation beyond the city shaping disaster risk? And I should really say that there's not a lot of work on this at all um, that's been done. There's certainly been a lot of really great initial scholarship on um, small cities and, and thinking about scale, thinking about rurality and how it relates to environment. Um, but in terms of thinking about specifically this group of fast urbanizing rural places, there's not been a ton of work out there. And so, um, you know, I, I, I've tried to, in my papers, really point to the best work, but this is a, an area that's really ripe for, for research in my view. And so uh, because there's not a lot of work there, I found that the, the, the key um, task was really to be, uh, generate some foundational research um, that, you know, just to produce some of the, the hunches that we have, just to start putting some empirical evidence to some of the, the fundamental hunches we have in order to build a bigger research program 
um, later. And so I'm focusing in on um, the Darjeeling district. Um, now today, as we sit, it's the Darjeeling and Kalimpong districts because the Kalimpong district was broken off from Darjeeling a few years ago. But the Darjeeling district in West Bengal, um, some of you are probably very familiar, some of you may not be as familiar, but this is that area uh, very far Northwest Bengal bordering on Sikkim, um, really the, you know, from the plains um, in Siliguri up to um, the, the foothills of the Himalayas and the steep mountainous areas and the small cities like Kalimpong and um, Darjeeling, Kursiang are all in this area. And so this is, this is the urbanization that I'm seeing and I'm thinking of these last six or seven years as I've been working on this project with partners in this region is, um, again, very different than the old Delhi picture that we looked at earlier, but very much a city that's, that's, that's featured in a, in a really challenging landscape, a beautiful landscape, but a challenging landscape from an urban development perspective. We have fast growing settlements like this that are happening on steep hillsides uh, in enver very environmentally hazardous areas. And so the Darjeeling district is a microcosm, I think, of the overall larger issue that I talked about earlier. Um, its population is fast growing. So in 20 years, it added uh, about six lakh population, which again, in the overall Indian context, that's not a lot, but it shows this rapid growth of population. And this probably undercounts the population pretty significantly because there are a lot of, of migrant laborers working in this area, a lot of folks who come in for school and other things and then leave. And so the population is probably closer to, to something like two and a half million people, but still it shows this fast growth um, that has happened there uh, and the attendant transformation of the, the built environment. And so when I talk about natural hazards and disasters in the Darjeeling district, I'm really talking about two types of hazards. The first are landslides, which are um, absolutely a feature of any mountainous uh, region in the world, but especially in the Eastern Himalayas, the Western Himalayas, um, this is the sort of the center of, of landslide losses worldwide is in this, these regions that stretch across um, you know, Pakistan, India, uh, you know, into, into China. And so a lot of the, the, the risks from landslides are centered in this highly populated area with a lot of, um, a lot of landslide activity due to the, the geology uh, and geography of the region. Um, we're also talking about earthquakes, which again are uh, quite common in this region. Um, there was, you know, the, uh, the Sikkim earthquake back in, uh, I'm forgetting the year, maybe 2011 was a 7.1 earthquake that was, a, a, you know, shook the region, but we're expecting a much larger earthquake to happen anytime. Um, and th so this is in seismic zone four and five. And so it's, it's at the most risk in the world to, to seismic events. And we could very well see a, a similar earthquake as this, the size of the one in Nepal a few years ago, um, closer to the, you know, on the Indian side of the border, which could have devastating consequences across this entire region. So I'm trying to think about landslides and earthquakes as the two most common hazard types that threaten uh, people and resources there. Okay, so how do I study this intersection between small, um, small city uh, or small town village urbanization and environmental risk? Well, I bring in um, a, conceptual framework that's um, pretty well established and validated within the international hazards and, and disaster research literature. It's called the MOVE framework. Uh, and again, I'm not going to spend a ton, a ton of time on this given our constraints today, but you can read much more about it in my article and then link to the original pieces that discuss it. But it's the important thing to say is that it's a holistic framework for thinking about disaster risk. It incorporates the hazard element itself, the or landslides and the earthquakes, but it also incorporates uh, issues of vulnerability. Uh, and then also really crucially to me, because I'm, I'm a, what they call a pracademic, I think a lot about research, but it's research connection to professional practice and professional planning. How does governance then try to intercede in this risk creating process? And how does, does governance try to more effectively reduce risk? Um, this, this framework kind of captures it all. Um, the other nice thing about this framework is that it's not prescriptive whatsoever. It doesn't tell you which variables to use. It's a pure conceptual framework. And so the opportunity was for me to work. I worked for two years just getting the variables identified on the ground in Darjeeling um, before I moved on to actual data collection. And so it allowed me to take this framework and then create, uh, create a specific research instruments that were tailored to the context of the place, which again is the problem with so much of our research where they try to take a framework from somewhere else and plop it down on top of Indian cities and it just doesn't work because 
cities are very different everywhere and even cities within Indian states are different. And so we, in my mind, we need conceptual frameworks that give us the flexibility to do variable identification. And so um, I, I did this study in five different areas around the Darjeeling district. Um, this involved a lot of different field research visits um, with and working with local partners. Um, we did structured interviews with, with 27 key informants that really guided this variable selection process. Um, and then we did a, a purposeful sample with 139 households. This is a very much a pilot of what we hope will be a multi-state um, comparative study that we'll be launching next year. Um, and then we did a lot of on the ground GIS work and mapping of community assets. So again, this is, you know, we're, we're collecting data from below, we're collecting data from the side, we're collecting data from above with things like the census. And we're trying to create a complete rich, thick account of these places and what's happening there and how risk um, is being built up. And, and hopefully we've accomplished that. And I think we, you know, we've really um, in dialogue with our partners on the ground and continuing to present this work there. I hope our discussants will be able to shed light on whether we captured the essence of the places. Um, lastly, and this is a really important piece of something to mention is we use remotely sensed imagery from 2007 and 2017 to recreate through visual imagery, the urban growth, since for a lot of different reasons, it's really difficult to measure urban growth in these places. Um, we did it through remotely sensed imagery. Um, if there are any students on the call today or any advisors of students on the call today, I just wanna say that the GOI Foundation, which is the um, philanthropic arm of the GOI Corporation, which does a lot of, they, they run Google's, um, uh, satellites. They have their own high resolution, very expensive private imagery as well. They have a foundation where you can apply for, to be given for research purposes, imagery. And so they gave us something like 50,000 US dollars worth of imagery for this study through that foundation for free. And that's a program that's really underutilized. And it's a remarkable, I think a remarkable resource for Indian researchers um, that you should take advantage of if, if you can. Okay, so the, the, the five study areas that we looked at were, were Pubuzar, uh, Lebong, Lower Chibo, uh, Dungra, and Pedong, which are these, uh, uh, you know, were selected specifically, they were sampled in order to represent the range of different types of fast urbanizing rural places. So they include remote, a remote rural village, they include the sort of uh, a town that's right nearby a larger city, the sort of suburb, if you would, of a city. It includes a, a, a census town. Um, so it kind of covers the full range of different kinds of places that we think about when we think of rural urbanization. Uh, and these are these are all the different defined variables that we used. I'm only going to talk about a couple of the different dimensions today just to give you a flavor of the research, but you can read the full paper and the next paper coming out if you want a more in-depth discussion of the different pieces. But today we're just going to talk about the exposure element, the economic dimension of vulnerability, and then a little bit about risk governance. Um, so again, exposure is this idea of, you know, what's present in hazardous areas? When a landslide happens, when an earthquake happens, what stuff, what people, what stuff do that they use, what economic resources, what infrastructure is located there and thereby um, subject to potential losses. So this is one example. We did this for all of our case study areas, but this is one example of our exposure study. So here's the, the Dungra area. And so this, as you can see from the satellite image, if you look at the, the top of the picture, you'll see this sort of dense built up area along the ridges. And then you have to imagine the topography of this area, very mountainous. This is a steep downhill towards the, the valley below. And you can see the joras, the, the drainages running down with that are forested because they have a lot of water flowing through them. And so this is a, a lot of growth at the top and then going down the hill towards the river below. And so that's what this, so we hand mapped each little building and went through and did this. This is something like 7,000 buildings that we did. And then, so what we can do is we can basically, this is a 10 year period. The differences in structures yeah. between, sorry. No problem, please go on. Okay, um, so this is this is 2007 or 2006. Um, these are all the structures and roadways that were there in this, this in Dungra in that year. This is 2017, so or 2016. So this is just in 10 year period, all of the red are new buildings, new roads that were grown in this one area over that time. That is, it's in a remarkable rate of growth that's happening. And we saw that across all of our study areas. So in Dungra, we saw a 38% increase in the number of buildings in just 10 years and a 30% increase in the number of roads, which we see as a really useful proxy for urban development, right? You need roads in order to then, as soon as you have a road, you start building up the buildings usually. Um, 
In Labong, it was 40% growth over 10 years. In Lower Chibo, it was 42%. In Padong, it was 55% growth in just 10 years. This is in just an incredible, it's, it's almost, to me, it's a mind boggling amount of, of growth that's happening in a very short period of time that's happening almost entirely under the radar of the state. The state has, uh, in my view, <laughs> very little idea of what's happening, especially because the census periods are very spread out. And the, 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 the area of the census where they mark um, structures and buildings is extremely underutilized. Um, and so that's what this looks like when you put it onto a sort of a, a really rough 3D map where you see again, you see the, the high areas um, which are, have been the traditional older parts of the town and the village and then the red areas that are growing in. And you see this sort of, if you really look closely, you'll start to see that the direction of growth is very much downhill. People are, you know, all the best land has been occupied and all the safest land has been occupied. And so where is urban growth going to go? Well, it's gonna go into more hazardous areas, especially steep slopes, poorly um, drained areas, areas um, prone to flooding and, and landslides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, we, and we prove that as well. Um, statistically, we show that there is a, a pretty heavy growth into steep slope areas. So um, I think I have the numbers. I do not have the numbers here. There we go. Yeah, so 43% of the buildings on steep slopes, which is more than what we define using the Indian Geological Survey's definition, 43% of the steep slopes, uh, buildings on steep slopes in Dungra were built just in the last decade. Um, and so, we, and we see that across all of our different study areas, we see uh, beyond which even the rate of growth, we see a higher growth in steeper slope areas, which means we have more and more growth being built uh, in areas prone to landslides. Um, I should also say just quickly, um, this is an image of some of the growth in Dungra. Um, again, this is a village. Um, this is a governed as village. This has a, a village, you know, uh, a panchayat that, that, that runs the, the village council, runs the, the issues there. There's no urban development body there. And yet this is the kind of structures that are being built in, in a steep sloped area. This is a slope of 22% on this land, which is hard to see, but if you look up behind, you can see the tree lines. This means this is an extreme uh, risk to landslides. And yet we see this four or five story building coming up with more rebar at the top showing that additional floors will be added. This is the story we see again and again and again in this region where we have vertical growth happening, not just horizontal growth and happening in very hazardous areas, which means a land a slide could certainly knock this building down relatively easily, but especially a strong earthquake would, could knock this building down. And so we see this, um, the risk to environmental hazards is being built in real time into the environment but it may not be released for some time. We may not realize this risk for some time until a hazard happens, but it's very much there. This building represents a significant amount of risk to the people who live there, the economic activities that are happening there, um, the people who live down slope from them. This is the kind of building that would never be recommended under building codes um, or development codes, but is happening nonetheless in all of these places. Uh, okay, second, so the economic dimension of vulnerability, this is the, the loss, uh, potential loss from economic value. Um, so if you have an earthquake or a landslide, you could lose your economic assets, you could lose your shop, you could lose your, your, your place of business, but you could also, it could disrupt your productive capacity. Your field gets uh, washed out and so you can't produce uh, whatever agricultural goods, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, we see some really remarkable changes that are happening in these places. It's not just a physical transformation, it's also an economic transformation. So this area actually has um, higher than average incomes for the whole region. When we break out all of these individual towns and villages in the census, um, there is, it, it kind of makes sense. These are fast growing areas, which means there's, there's prosperity there, there's investment happening, there's growth happening there. Um, and so there's higher than average incomes in these study areas than the state overall. And yet there's still 25% of, of people live on less than 2000 rupees a month. So there's still extreme levels of poverty and a growing division between high income earners and lower income earners. Um, Income is seasonally variable, which as you, you know, this makes sense in not only an agricultural region, but a region that is heavily dependent on tourism and visitors. Um, you know, there's a, there's a high variability of, of um, 
income, which again is very vulnerable to shocks. If you have a shock during the high season, all of a sudden you've lost a year of income potentially, and that's a big issue. Um, on the positive side, there's very high connection to bank accounts, um, probably due to various schemes and programs that require connection to bank accounts, but th this area is well connected to the financial institutions that could push out resources in the event of a disaster and get money in people's hands quickly. Um, probably most important in this study is that we see this incredible decline in agriculture that's happened in this region. Um, and we see this both in the census numbers, but also then in our surveys and also then in our interviews. So you see in a 20 year period, you see a drop in, um, you know, the, as agriculture is the main occupation from 25% to 10%, and you see a drop in agricultural labor from 12 to 6%. And so where are those jobs going? Where are people being employed? Well. The growth of the region, the, this incredible urbanization that's happened is also providing all of the jobs or a lot of these jobs that are being lost. So you have incredible rise in the number of people uh, employed in construction industries, both at the sort of higher levels and lower levels. Um, you also see a growth in the education and tourism as, as major uh, industries. And so again, all of these are very vulnerable to disaster impacts. People won't come to Darjeeling if the roads are, are washed out from landslides and send their kids to schools there. If there's a major earthquake that takes 10 or 20 years to recover from, centers of education uh, and tourism will shift elsewhere. And so these are all, um, as compared to agriculture, these are industries that are very susceptible to shocks and not just in the short term, but also in the long term could take a very long time to recover. Um, and then I should, I should say the image on the right is just, you know, very common, you know, there's a lot, there's a, many of the people who are previously employed as agricultural labor now work as construction laborers. And again, if that industry dries up, um, whether because of a slowing down of growth or just because of a, a major disaster, you will see um, these knock-on effects down the chain to folks who you know, day, day to day uh, rely on subsistence of these kind of, of heavy manual jobs. Okay, then lastly and briefly, I'll talk about risk governance. So this is one other dimension of the, the framework that I'm studying. So this is about, you know, how do the decisions and actions taken by these stakeholders, especially governments and institutions, how do they help to identify this risk? How do they help to reduce it? How do they help mitigate it or transfer it to things like insurance? You know, the folks who are supposed to be looking at a planning level across these different places and thinking about risk and thinking how to, to you know, match this, you know, we never are gonna get rid of all risk. We want some economic growth. We want these regions to be booming and productive and people to be employed. But we also want to keep, you know, we want to have an acceptable level of risk where that whole thing can't fall down in a major earthquake. And so we think of governments and, and non-governmental institutions as the ones who really think holistically about these issues. So how are they doing? Um, that's the question we ask. Uh, and the answer, unfortunately, is not very well. Um, and as was already described earlier, this confirms a lot of what we know. Um, we know that these areas do not have strong planning or development institutions. Um, development regulation is very much piecemeal and it's very much not sensitive to natural hazards. You will see that in the vast majority of cases in these places, developments are approved almost on a, you know, a pro forma basis. There's no um, organization or body in these villages that has the expertise or the political interest in limiting or controlling development. And you'll see so widespread, almost universal flouting of building codes and regulations, which are themselves vestiges of the colonial development. So the, the, the development code overall doesn't make sense for this region anyway, because it was imposed on it by the, the Britishers. But also even that you see this widespread flouting of any kind of building codes or regulations. Um, this is just one small quote that I, I was talking to someone who's very experienced in development, um, has developed a lot of projects in this area and saying, um, you know, over in my lifetime, they were saying no building plan was ever rejected in the last municipal government. There's no town planning, no long-term thinking. You give them 10,000 rupees and they were talking about for the permit fee, um, that's it. You can build what you like. Um, I spoke to another, you know, again, this is, um, a, many, many interviews over many years, but you know, representative of someone said, well, I, you know, I was asking them how they could build their, they had a new hotel they just built on a steep slope. And I said, how can you, you know, build this hotel? And they said, well, you know, I just built it. And then I figured I would deal with the code violations afterwards. And, you know, I'll, I'll clean them up later. And that's, I think, a pretty common um, perspective. Um, 
you see that the urban development schemes, infrastructure and service schemes are not available to these places. So any, anything from the, um, you know, from the, the JNN URM all the way through the more recent uh, urban development schemes that have focused on smaller cities, none of those are available to urban or rural places. Most of rural development support is agricultural support um, as well as employment support, not necessarily thinking about um, urban, urban, urbanization uh, and, and how to manage it. Um, state and local disaster management plans are not really plans, they're response documents. This is an example on the right. This is the, uh, I think the Darjeeling hazard mitigation plan and it's a list of phone numbers to call of, of key people. You know, that's the, it doesn't function as we would want it to function as a, a preventative or a strategic plan. Rather, it, fo it focuses much more as a response plan and that doesn't do much work to mitigate hazards. Um, in this region in particular, there's very limited resources for NGOs for a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons um, that we don't have time to talk about, but there's not a, a huge NGO support network that's like filling in the gaps that urban governance is leaving. So there's a real vacuum of leadership um, in terms of urban development in many of these places. Um, although it does seem to be improving, there is a vacuum. Um, and then finally, um, and I thought this was the most important um, or one of the most important um, pieces is that this place is also extremely underinsured. Um, households are concerned about natural hazards. And if you look at our survey data, households identify natural hazards very fluently. They understand the risks. They worry about the risks and, and to their assets. They worry about the risks to their livelihoods and their children. But they also have this very low penetration of insurance products, which are used in most places to try to mitigate risk. So um, less than 3% have any access to health insurance and less than 1% have access to any kind of property insurance. So there's this dependence on the state to come in after a disaster to make people whole, um, but that's not a particularly uh, effective or efficient way of, of transferring risk. Um, and most, I think in a lot of places that have more successfully done this, you'll see a reliance on insurance as a, as a key risk transfer um, device. Um, okay, so I've talked through my time. Um, I, this is my last slide. I just want to say a few key takeaways. If there's you know, policy makers listening, <clears throat> or these are the these are the same messages that I have delivered in Darjeeling in Kalimpong to municipal government um, members and people of the of the district and state government when I've had a chance to talk. Um, these are my key kind of takeaways, the messages that I brought. Um, I really talked to them about you know the transformation that's happening outside of cities and especially in the built environment and the changing uh, dynamics of employment. I talked to them about the mismatch scale between, you know, urbanization is happening much faster than the tools and capacities of the local governments to manage it is evolving. So we have this incredible mismatch of speed that, you know, all of this stuff is happening while there's not no one really paying too much attention to it. And by the time it, we are paying attention, it may be too late. So much of this risk is already built, written into the environment waiting for that disaster to, to expose it. And that's what I really worry about. Um, urbanization can be a force for disaster vulnerability reduction. There's lots of ways that urbanization can improve our disaster risk, but instead it's happening very much unnoticed and unmanaged in this region. Um, and that a lot of that comes to uh, these places still being governed as rural places rather than uh, fast urbanizing places. Um, this urbanization is also very largely invisible to scholars and policymakers who study India very closely. And I think um, a lot of the focus is on large cities, more focus is happening on smaller cities, but this is even a nut, yet another level of urbanization that's very sparse, the, the attention being paid to it. Um, and then finally, you know, urbanization has reduced some of the key factors of vulnerabilities in this areas, um, but it's also produced this entirely new landscape of risk and risk is being accumulating day by day, day by day. And when a major hazard releases it, I think I really worry that we're gonna have a, a generationally um, tragic disaster that could happen in this region, especially a major earthquake because of all of these decisions that have happened so rapidly in terms of what stuff is being built, how it's being built, and then how the economy has transformed uh, as a result of it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I can, I can dip back into this slide a little bit later um, if we want to in terms of specific policy recommendations I might make. Um, I did wanna just quickly point out, uh, there's about four or five publications that I could, um, that sort of, 
you know, form the, the body of this work that I've been working on. Here are the two key ones that if you're interested as a researcher, you'd like to read. The first one is um, the piece from the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction. This one lays out the move framework, all the variable selection does the summary of, of findings, much more, a bit more of the empirical side of things. Um, the one on the right is from the, the um, is from, it's called Disaster Risk Creation in the Darjeeling Himalayas Moving Towards Justice. This lays out the really the qualitative evidence and the, the sort of years long gathering of information and trying to piece together the sort of development context that's happening in this place. And so I think if you read those two pieces together, you get a pretty clear picture of what I'm trying to do um, in this work. Um, lastly, I just want to acknowledge this is not a, a, a solo effort. This is an effort that's been going on for uh, over a decade now a collaboration between myself and students, and especially Save the Hills, which is a community-based organization uh, based in Kalampong, but that works across the Darjeeling Himalayas. Um, I, really, this organization has um, made these things possible. We've worked together, we've trained together, we've done our research together. And so I just wanna always recommend Save the Hills as a, as a phenomenal example of what a community-based organization can do, especially uh, when they're able to leverage relationships and bring different um, strengths to bear on problems. They've re made remarkable progress from um, just raising awareness of these landslide issues to, to moving real science on the ground and, and are involved in a lot of different efforts to um, hopefully uh, reduce risk to people in this region, uh, especially to landslides. So thank you and I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, any feedback and also answer any questions. Thank you, thank you for your very insightful presentation. And uh, today uh, we have a, a very good number of uh, discussions. So, but uh, but as a customary uh, practice, just let me uh, uh, just uh, have some uh, few comments on on uh, Dr. Rombo's presentation. Like as he mentioned throughout uh, by his presentation that that urbanization has, has transformed the villages and towns in fundamental ways. For example, he mentioned about the growth of the built environment, the changing dynamics of employment due to the shifts in the local and regional economy. And also uh, uh, this, 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 there has been an increase in environmental risk uh, with this urbanization. Uh, and it also co contributes to the environmental degradation. And, but the thing is that problem is uh, this, this kind of urbanization is remain largely unnoticed. And at the same time, uh, 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 Dr. Ramat mentioned that the urbanization also contributed to, to reducing vulnerability for some households, for example, by ensuring uh, them certain access to certain economic opportunities, for example, tourism, or by increasing the availability of, say, transportation, communication infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So, so, so and regarding the risk governance, uh, 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 the growth in villages and towns, uh, he mentioned that they are largely unplanned and unchecked, uh, which further increases the likelihood of future disaster losses. And, and unfortunately, uh, the urban development schemes, the, uh, the standard urban development schemes which are available in India, the, the benefits of those urban, uh, urban development schemes are not available to these places uh, because, uh, th because these are still governed as rural. And also he mentioned about the lack of capacities of, of the central state and local government to manage the pace and scale of urbanization that these areas have been uh, uh, experiencing and the associated disaster risk. Uh, uh, at the household level, for example, he mentioned that the household they do not have access to insurance product. So, 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 and finally, uh, one final out, uh, thing is that, that, that we need to uh, really save the hills uh, from these uh, unplanned and unchecked uh, uh, sort of urbanization. So, uh, so thank you once again. Uh, but before, uh, I think um, uh, uh, we have some discussions. So I'm seeing uh, Dr. Avina Valkandra with us. So uh, uh, should we start with you? Uh, uh, if you are, uh, if you can comment on uh, his presentation and yeah, so, sure. uh, before that, just, just, just again, it's a formality. May I ask Arjun to introduce formally uh, Dr. Avina? <laughs> Since this is a, uh, uh, this is a. Yes, yes, why yes, not? Yes, please, yes. Yes, so Dr. Avinav Alexandre is a assistant professor at University of Florida and also directs the Center for Design and International Planning there. Uh, so why, why don't you continue? Yes. Yes, please. Happy to have you at a, such oh. a start notice. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Thank you, Andrew, for such a good presentation. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, listen to you. And here we meet again. Uh, so 
Arjun, basically, you know, he gave me a very, very uh, uh, late notice, but then uh, he basically blackmailed me that, you know, Andrew is coming. Do you want to come? I said, fine, you know, uh, I'll do that. So it's, it's for you. <laughs> Uh, okay, but, uh, you know, as usual, uh, I think, you know, what you were talking about is a very, very important, pertinent issue uh, in Indian context. And, and I would say not only in Indian context, even internationally, there are so many people who are working on disaster, like in South America, in uh, Africa, in uh, East Asia. But uh, uh, we don't find, you were so right, we don't find many people talking about this in Indian context. I have heard uh, you know, a couple of talks or a couple of, I have seen a couple of papers uh, talking about Urisa, but not so much about uh, Northeast. So definitely, and uh, uh, thank you for that suggestion, that uh, GOI Foundation. I think this is definitely going to benefit a lot of people. And uh, uh, I think I'm going to make sure, I didn't know about that. So I'm going to make sure that, you know, I spread the word. Uh, so let me couple... let me just say if if anyone would needs a sample application, please just send me. I'll send you the one I submitted for this. If you want to see how we applied, yeah, happy to share. Perfect, perfect. So you know, th there's so many things uh, uh, which struck me, but uh, uh, let me ask you and and uh, a couple of things which I think is very very important, and you definitely talked about them. One is the governance part. So uh, why people are building in these sensitive area or uh, uh, disaster prone area, there could be many reasons, but definitely one could be education. They don't know the extent of the problem. So that who is uh, uh, basically responsible to educate them? That's that one part of it, which I think should be in the debate because you know when we talk about public policy, we always talk about mitigation rather than uh, we should also be talking about the prevention. So maybe education, but then if people really don't have any other place to go, if they don't build in that particular growing city, they, are, they may miss on the economic opportunity, potential economic opportunity. I understand that too, but there might be definitely some people who are building because they are not educated, they don't know about the extent of the problem. So I think you know that should be part of the uh, larger discussion. Second, the institutions. Uh, you talked about uh, um, civil society, NGOs. NGOs have become weak in India in the last decade or so. There is no doubts about it. There's too much of literature on that. Um, and there are many political reasons for that. So I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but NGOs, they, can, they have played an important role. They play an important role. But what other government institutions or institutions which are backed by uh, uh, either public money or uh, which is simply at the local level. So panchayat is definitely uh, uh, more formal, more organized, but uh, do you think that you know there could be some more institutions which are there and can uh, uh, bring into the forefront? So these two things like you know uh, 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 public policy response, not only about the mitigation, also it could be prevention. And the uh, third thing is livelihood. So again, there are many people, I believe, I don't know much about disaster. I know a little bit about urbanization. So many people, they understand the risk, they evaluate the risk, and they simply look at, okay, you know, this is simple cost benefit analysis for me. I am going to build here knowing the risk. Why? Because I need my livelihood. And in India, that has been a problem. Uh, uh, you know, we don't have a very, uh, if you look at the employment pattern in India, uh, we don't have, uh, we, we have to have, we have to have uh, engage in these kind of uh, risky activities, let's put it that way. So, uh, and then finally, of course, you, you were spot on about the uh, government response. Government has been largely uh, uh, simply absent from all these uh, uh, disaster related po policy making. So for example, you were talking about building permits in, uh, uh, in the region. That is true with almost all of the India. B, uh, B class and C class cities, not the A class. It's, it's very hard to do anything in Delhi, Mumbai, like you know, the metro cities. But if you go to uh, 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 second tier or third tier cities, in, for example, I work on Patna. I know for sure that in last, uh, uh, the city planner post has been vacant from last 35 years in Patna. 
So think about this, vacant. Government never thought about fulfilling. It's a government job, secure job, and government is not uh, willing to give that post to anyone. So I, I totally uh, get it. So thank you once again. Uh, I think you talked about really, really important stuff. Thank you. Um, if I yeah, if I could just say a few things, um, and doc, thank you for your it. Yes, or Dr. Andrew, we have uh, uh, quite a few discussant also. If you oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yes, go uh, go ahead so that you can also pause after your uh, uh, lecture, and we can collect the question. Then you can choose to answer. Okay. Yes, no. but if you want to uh, respond to no, 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 please continue, please continue. Yeah. Because two very important points he made. One was for the, you know the economic dimension of livelihood, and also the the second part. Even in our greater metropolitan area, uh, there has been no following of anything, uh, Doctor Avino. Uh, like uh, in the second third tier also. But when we see, for example, Greater Hyderabad or Delhi, all the NCR, uh, any any bigger region. So in the periphery, there is so much of uh, such a uneven development which is going on. And the institutional divide. So, uh, Dr. Somyadip, why don't we go to yes. our discussion and collect all the questions? Yes. So, may I now just request? I'm yes. just uh, saying that Binayak Sindhas is raising his hand. So, uh, well, uh, just it, let it, me introduce. It, it, uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, Dr. Binayak Sindhas. He is an assistant professor at the Center for Himalayan Studies, University of North Bengal, uh, where he holds the chair for history. And his area of interest is. Himalayan histories, Sikkim, North Bengal Hills, and Nepal, and he is a regular contributor to uh, My Republic, a national daily in Nepal. So, but before uh, proceeding to uh, uh, Dr. Sundas, may I now re may I request you to just uh, please be brief uh, within maybe within three three minutes. It's sure, awesome. <clears throat> I, I don't think I'll take three minutes either. Uh, Andrew, I, I just want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Sorry. Please. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, first of all, you know, I just drove back from Karimpong a few days back, and I nearly skid off the road because of the landslide. And skidding off the road on that road would mean certain death. So you know, when you talked about earthquakes, it sort of struck a uh, sorry uh, landslides sort of struck a chord with me. I just wanted to ask you a few things, and this is something that I I, I felt that you were alluding to, and it's something my center is also trying to do, which is is it uh, you know is. Is it necessary to evolve a conceptualization of an Himalayan urbanization? Uh, you kept mentioning that how, you know, what is happening in, the, in, in places like Darjeeling or even elsewhere in the Himalayas is, is actually neglected, uh, you know, for, because uh, what is standard theories and, and, and sort of policies probably don't sort of relate uh, to our region. So is there a necessity to come up with, with the concept of, uh, you know, a Himalayan urbanization theory? Uh, secondly, considering how development is seen as a opposite, as an opposition uh, to the statehood movement, do you really, and, and how development is seen in terms of buildings and so on and so forth, do you really see, uh, you know, and you must have seen the nexus of politicians and builders and how you know, large buildings are seen as a status symbol in, in our region. Uh, do you really think that any sort of planning or any sort of government, uh, you know, uh, uh, intervention would make any difference to that? Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, well, so uh, may I now move to uh, Dr. Dhiraj Barman. So he's an assistant professor at Presidency University. Uh, uh, Dr. Barman is trained as a social geographer and his research interests are towards understanding the socio-political processes which uh, produces different geography spaces in the contemporary world. It's over to Diraj. Uh, first of all, uh, I uh, beg to an apology that uh, I couldn't attend uh, at time uh, when this lecture started. Uh, uh, as I listened to your lecture, uh, Professor Andrew, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, as a discussion uh, to this uh, lecture, uh, my contribution uh, would be uh, to situate Darjeeling within the framework of your ecological crisis or sustainability that you have uh, put forward in your whole lecture. My understanding about Darjeeling and the whole North Bengal region is, uh, is, may, is based on my own experience from being a, a, a person from that locality also. So my understanding is that uh, if we try to look uh, this entire crisis of ecology, then it is somewhat situated within this ethnopolitical development 
from 1986 onwards. From last 30 years, uh, it is uh, the entire political crisis somehow it destroyed overall governance in the hills. So uh, if we, uh, as just uh, mentioned that uh, if we try to understand uh, Himalayan or if we try to understand Darjeeling in particular, I think somehow Darjeeling doesn't fit within this whole framework of Himalaya or within this whole framework of sustainability in the hills uh, as you uh, have, uh, I mean, uh, continued in our discussion. My understanding of Darjeeling is poorly as an overlooked area because of ethno-political crisis over the last 30 years, the entire governance has systematically been destroyed. Uh, there are obviously there are institutions, but uh, 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 in, as far as Darjeeling is concerned, uh, uh, unlike the other parts of West Bengal, Darjeeling is, uh, uh, is controlled by GTA. So it's a separate kind of an institutional framework that we should look uh, into this whole discussion. Thirdly, uh, what about the, uh, the mainstream economics uh, or economies that was continued in the hills? That was the tea economy. And tea economy has been systematically died down over the years. Uh, although tea has contributed significantly into the economy of the entire country, but unfortunately, if we look into the, uh, uh, the livelihood of the workers, uh, uh, it is a pathetic state of affairs. And, and the second point that I would like to uh, mention here, uh, what about the governance of land? Uh, at least uh, millions of people uh, in the Tarai and Darjeeling, they're living in the, uh, working in the tea gardens, but they still don't have rights to lands. So it is another thing that why people are, uh, are, are taking these risks to put their houses, build, build their houses into that steep slopes. I think this political economy of land and the land rights under the Plantation Labor Act 1951, we should look into the same manner as we are discussing Darjeeling within the, your uh, entire framework of analysis. Uh, uh, that is all uh, what I uh, wanted to mention here. Thank you, Professor Andrew, for this, uh, uh, this very insightful lecture. Thank you uh, to all panels and Arjun especially for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bauman. So uh, now I uh, move to Dr. Ruma Kundu. Uh, she teaches at Sikkim University and she has uh, her research interest uh, in environmental economics. So if you please make your comments, observation, questions, if any. It's over to you, uh, Dr. Kundu. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Yep. Okay, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, for listening to the uh, to uh, for this this illuminating uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Andrew. Uh, you have highlighted so many uh, important uh, points here. Uh, but my point is that that is uh, I am also belonging in Sikkim, uh, Sikkim in the hill only. So I have also seen that uh, in Sikkim there are uh, that is basically uneven uh, development. It is also going on, but uh, my. Uh, and you have mentioned in your lecture that is uh, there are so many uh, um, uh, livelihood opportunities that uh, it, uh, that is created by uh, urbanization. But my uh, worry is that uh, whether this uh, like uh, for example tourism. So uh, due to this uh, uh, tourism sector, if tourists visits uh, this place again, uh, there is the damage uh, of the environment. So my, uh, my my point is that the how uh, how how can we segregate this? Whether it is the this environmental damage is created by this uh, what I can say tourism sector or this is due to urbanization separately. Uh, as you can mention, that is we we all understand that uh, that in the cities uh, of course that is the uh, risk of urbanization. But in the, the villages that is in the rural part of Sikkim that I have seen that that is also landsliding. That is also the earthquake problem. All these hazards are there. And uh, in your lecture, I have seen that. That is uh, uh, agriculture laborer. That is uh, basically twelve percent. It, it has been decreased from twelve percent to six six percent. Okay, but uh, in Sikkim, my experience is not like that. So many people, many people are still working in the agriculture sector. We all know that is it is not pure agriculture. It is it is different from uh, he, uh, mountain agriculture. It is different from uh, basically uh, from the plains. Uh, it is mountain farming only. They are only involved. Uh, there are so many activities they are doing there. But still, people are moving from migrating from rural to urban for their livelihood, other livelihood opportunities. 
so uh, my uh, only worry is that how these uh, positive uh, impacts that is basically uh, related to um, urbanization uh, it, uh, that is people are uh, moving from uh, uh, only from uh, that is how this whether our urbanization is urbanization is solely responsible or this is the tourism sector which creates the uh, what a negative impacts to the environment which one is responsible thank you thank you dr kundu so uh, uh, can we take some more comments or question and then only uh, if you prefer to answer to all of them uh, i think let us go to <laughs> so many questions right now so what do you prefer dr rambar would you prefer uh, to answer it's, now it's your show it's your show <laughs> yeah no, dr and please go ahead well uh thank i mean these are wonderful comments thank you and uh, yeah i think they're you know some of them are i i'm looking forward to meeting each of you and sitting and and talking and and having a, a real dialogue about these questions i think they're you know crucially important and i um so i i guess maybe i'll i'll kind of do them a little bit chronologically and i won't be able to hit them all um so for um Abhinav by uh with the new beard which looks fantastic um he was talking about the uh oh am i paused no it's fine oh okay sorry You're um good. my screen froze there for a second so i you know i think the the point that you made about the especially about the um the economic transformations and how how we think about land development in the context of people who are building i think that's was an, an important part of my study and something that i'm really focusing on for the next um, sort of next iteration of this study is you know where does knowledge of risk meet um, both the interests in development but also the um, the foundational rights that people have to land and you know i think you know anyone working in this context, we'll talk about, you know, land is a precious commodity in the hills. It's not, I think it's a slightly different concept than it is in, in the plains and other areas. And so you have, um, you know, even within these steep topographies, you have, you know, very limited number of land resources that are developable, even at risk, you know, that's still a precious commodity. And so, you know, again and again, when I talk to a lot of um, building owners who are building, constructing in ways that may be relatively dangerous, asking them um, about the, the practice, they return to either the, you know, where else can I build? This is the only land that we have, or this is my, this is my land and I have a right to develop on it. So there's, you know, very, you know, not necessarily a naiveness, at least in the, the, the folks that I've talked to over the years about the risk, um, but certainly a feeling that, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's definitely a trade-off between um, being able to develop the one piece of, of, of developable land you have versus the potential long-term risk. And that's a, I mean, that's a human instinct, right? That's the problem of disaster planners like myself is we're trying to fight against a human instinct to privilege short-term benefits over long-term risk. Um, I would say one dimension of this that I think is very, very important that maybe I, there's definitely been some work on it, but I think more work would be really well suited would, you know, the, the role of the engineer, the engineer plays in all of this. So most of these buildings are signed off on by an engineer who, you know, certifies that the, the design, the, the, the soil, the load bearing, all of these sorts of things are appropriate. So even if you can't get formal approval for development itself, you typically do have engineers who come and as part of the overall development package, come and examine these buildings and develop the plans for the buildings. And oftentimes these engineers are coming from outside the region. So I do think there is this, um, A, a reliance on a certain kind of expertise about buildings, someone telling you it's safe to build, even if they may not be well versed in the geology of the, of the, of the region. Um, and then there's also the secondary, and I think is the most important is that you then have that knowledge passed down to builders who then start to replicate that knowledge themselves and start to certify buildings as safe. So you no longer have the engineer involved, you have practice skills trader, people who've built several buildings and start to tell people that it's safe to build. And I think that that is probably contributing to some pretty risky decisions in terms of how um, these buildings are being constructed. Um, and then on top of that, you've got these additional floors that are being added that I don't think are being you know, thought of at all in the original schemes. Um, you know, uh, related to that, I think, um, you know, the, the comment and question about the fundamental relationship between um, the, you know, the, the political party development and the sort of the overall 
you know, many of you are familiar with the, the political context of the Darjeeling region. And that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to use this framework because it was, it did allow for me to think about these issues within the very specific context of um, the, the, the sovereignty movement and the, the separate administrative relationship between um, the, the, the Darjeeling area and the state. And so I talk about a lot of that in that EPE article and try to unpack as much as my understanding of how that then influences these issues. Uh, you're, I think you're right, very much right to point out that these issues make the region unique in a lot of ways and have certainly and severely undercut the, um, the strength of the governance systems, especially as it relates to local governments in the standing down of the panchayats, um, what some 15 years ago now, there has not been a panchayat election in many years. Um, at the same time, I, I, I do think that's true and I do think that's important. And I don't think you can understand this problem in this particular district without knowing that. But I also don't think that it's so unique that we can't draw lessons elsewhere. I do think that there um, are similar issues like I've done not as much work in Sikkim yet, but that's a goal of mine is to, to, to build out work in Sikkim. And I think you see some similar issues there. Definitely a different level of governance capacity, definitely a different relationship between the state and the district government and the relationship to uh, urban local bodies and panchayats. But you still see some of the same core themes happening, a relative mismatch of expertise where you have village leadership who is um, not trained to think about um, urban planning or, or how urban systems work together, making decisions about development. You still see a relatively a flouting of um, you know, formal development codes and building codes in favor of some other logic of development. Um, you still see this, the, these kinds of relationships that um, you often have a there's a very um, strange nexus between local planners, architects, builders, and developers where they are often serving the same role. The local planner may also be employed as a private developer. And that's a, a fundamental conflict of interest that's happening that allows a lot of um, site scale. To, and so all of that, to me, all of that adds up to there's no big picture thinking about development. And I, I find that to be true in Darjeeling, but I also find that to be true elsewhere. But a very well, point very well taken that the you can't understand this issue in the Darjeeling context unless you um, deeply understand the um, the, the context of, of the, the political situation there and the evolving um, political uh, threats that are happening um, between the state and, and the local government. Um, and then also, of course, the, 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 the statehood movement. Um, I, you know, I, and I, I do write more about that and I point to other people who I think really write well about it locally as well as internationally who are writing about it. And I'm, I'm still learning a lot there as well. Um, I, I do think that there is a need for a Himalayan urbaniz urbanism or some, you know, mountain urbanism. I don't think it's necessarily unique to the Himalayas. I think that there's some really interesting work going on um, in southern India, for example, um, with, with some work that's happening, um, but, you know, in other parts of other regions. But, and I do think there are nice steps that are being taken towards that. So the, the organization I mentioned, Save the Hills, along with many other organizations, is very much wrapped up in this EC mode. Um, you know, integrated mountain development um, initiative where they're doing a lot of work around sustainable development uh, in the, Himalaya, in the Himal Himalayas. But um, I don't know if they're, if I had a critique and I don't think Proffel does here, so I'll probably get in trouble if he is, but um, I can talk to him later about it. I do think that their focus on urbanization sometimes, um, I think there's more that's needed there. I think there's the issues of questions of land use have to be at the center of these discussions. And I don't think they're often, we're coming at it more from a developmental perspective, thinking about basic services, thinking about um, you know, agriculture, thinking, you know, these are all important issues, but the, the overall um, management of land has to be at the center of any kind of sustainable development in my mind. And I, I think that's often a part that gets short shrift in these conversations about a mountain urbanism. Um, and I think maybe that goes to that, one of those questions about, is this even possible in the Darjeeling district? Is there any way to ever regulate development? I, you know, to be honest, I don't know. That's, that's a really great question. I think um, I would argue that politically there is um, at, at a voter level, at a ground level where these, these politics are formed, right? These, these, these coalitions are made and are still um, very much driven by bottom-up concerns. 
Um, there is a, a very high, in all of our surveys, we saw a very high reporting of concerns over hazard issues, disaster issues, safety issues. People care about the same thing with disasters that everybody in the world cares about in terms of safety and livelihoods, um, and especially the safety of young people. Um, I do think there's space there for political movements to form that can develop more safely. Um, and I think that there is, that's that's beyond my, like, I think that's me stepping too far into to a realm that's, uh, you know, as trying not to step too far into thinking about local political movements, because that's, as a researcher, I'm just trying to provide, um, I'm trying to provide the, the types of information and data that local political movements can use in their own work. And, but I do think there's space there for um, uh, pro-development, pro-sustainable development, pro-statehood, pro pro-sovereignty pro movement that also, you know, part of sustainability is not falling down after a disaster and relying on the state to come in and rescue you. And so I think um, similar to a lot of the sort of rural um, resilience movements in the US where you have a lot of sort of very anti-state organizations that come together for the sake of, 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 of local sustainability and resilience so they don't have to rely on external structures of, of resources and power. Um, I think that could potentially have political, um, political momentum in a region that really pr prides itself on being independent and separate from the state of West Bengal. And, and uh, so I do see hope. Um, I do think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done and um, we can't, I think the last thing I would say, and you can't talk about all this without also talking about corruption in the development process. And there's there's some fundamental links that are corrupt um, in the process itself, um, where you know as long as you do have um, the ability to sort of pay for play with development, that will continue to be a major challenge. I think that that's that's the case everywhere in the world, and that's the that's a major challenge. But that's particularly acute in certain parts of the Darjeeling district, and I think. Um, you know, you can't not talk about that as a, as a, as a barrier. Um, you have to sort out some of those basic issues. And unfortunately, what we see in India in many places, um, including my work in the U.S., is that often the times when accountability starts to come into place and some of those corrupt practices get rooted out is after a major disaster, because you have suddenly the public starts to look at these things closely and say, we won't stand for this anymore. Um, and, and I, 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 hope that's not the case but unfortunately um you you know some of these processes are so um, deeply rooted in the system that it's going to take some major transformational changes to to affect them but that doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't try right um and again this stuff is happening in such fast at such a fast pace and 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 you know i think about disaster risk as like a clock being wound or a spring spring being wound up it's being wound up and it's being wound up and it's being wound up and it's getting tighter and tighter and you know, again, this is the risk is already being built there. Uh, so there's not, um, we don't want to wait for a major disaster to make foundational changes. Um, and so organizations like Save the Hills are so important because they've been able to operate for years and years now effectively in that context and build meaningful relationships in the context of everything happening in the Darjeeling district. And I think it's a real model for what local led political coalitions and actions means versus some researcher saying what should be done. Um, instead, we're, we're helping them to, to provide the, the information and data behind their hunches, and then they're the ones who are able to, to develop effective political strategies. Thank you, thank you. So I think- uh, uh, if, well, I'm sorry, one last thing. If I could last, uh, to, to Professor Kundu's um, mm -hmm. very great comments, I think, yes, I'm very interested. I would love to talk more. I, I would love to learn. I have worked in Sikkim to a certain degree and especially in some of the city, you know, some of the smaller areas uh, just outside of Gangtok. I would love to talk more about, especially in the Northern parts of the state and the, you know, a special kinds of visitor and tourism. I think you're absolutely right. There's, I don't think it's one or the other. I think they're very much intimately tied together. A certain kind of tourism and development has a degrades the environment, which then produces more landslides. So just like in Darjeeling, when you see the growth of all these hotels and visitors, that leads to, you know, lots of development, which leads to runoff, which leads to more landslides down the hill and villages below. I think you see the same things at a regional level in Sikkim. Um, I would love to talk more and learn more. I think there's going to be clear and stark differences between uh, even so close together, still, you know, worlds apart in terms of their governance, in terms of the overall um, visitor industry and, and what kind of visitors are drawing and the fragile ecologies that are there. But I think 
we have to think um, also, the, the, we have to think together as the mountain states, as the mountain regions um, in order to uh, advocate and fight for, uh, you know, we can't, we can't use the same kind of programs and schemes that are used in Southern India in the Himalayas. We need an entirely different approach that respects uh, mountain economies, mountain development, mountain political issues, but then also um, thinks about sustainability in, in, in very much in the mountain context. And that comes from the people in the mountains, not from elsewhere. And so I think that that, um, that, that is crucially important and we need much more research in these areas, not just in Sikkim and Darjeeling, but also in the Northeastern states. And, and I hope to see more of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. And I think we should all meet in the lovely hills of Darjeeling and uh, Dr. Abhinav should chair and, and also fund us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Savya, the poverty. Uh, yes, uh, so we are already, I think, overspread in terms of time. So, but just that, uh, before moving to Arjun, let me just uh, place my, two of my very specific questions. For example, uh, you have talked about that uh, obviously, there are some benefits as well as costs of fast-paced urbanization, but the impact is not same across the various socioeconomic groups. For example, you mentioned that the low-income low groups, they are found to be more vulnerable. So do you think that the benefits of urbanization outweigh its costs uh, for those economically marginalized population? And if so, then what are the policy options uh, to minimize the uh, future disaster losses? And secondly, uh, we all know about the uh, pathetic situation of the availability of data at the uh, this kind this this level. So, how to plan and improve the data availability, uh, which are extremely important for risk informed uh, planning. So, uh, this, I'm sorry. Can you, this, the second question, you can you repeat that question uh, one more this, time? This is about the regarding the data availability. For example, uh, how to yeah. plan and improve the availability of data, which are important for any risk informed planning, which are necessary to. Uh, uh, for uh, managing this kind of urbanization. Yes, no, it's, it's um, you're absolutely right. It's, it's on a number of levels, it's challenging. It's challenging because the, the and this actually goes to an earlier question, the Indian government, um, there's such, you know, this is the case, again, this is the case in a lot of places I work, especially in the US, but much more so in India, there's such a strong siloing of scientific research from social scientific research and local social science. And so to the point where, you know, we know that the Geological Survey of India has detailed soil map for the Darjeeling Hills type topologies. We have detailed information and it's not accessible to researchers, much less the public. We cannot make good. Well, I'm, I'm over here literally having to count houses with GIS and create, you know, um, used, you know, various uh, dubious methodologies to recreate slopes and type soil typologies and they have all of that data and refuse to share it and it's absolutely outrageous and, and you know if not with me then they should be sharing it with with organizations like save the hills who are in a position to use it to help local leaders make you know you can't make these decisions without good information and the information is not being provided even though it is it's available and that that drives me wild and you have the special issue of that in the, the hill regions where you have some sort of you know claim of security issues with, with the Chinese border. And you have these, these um, again, I don't, you know, maybe I've spent too much time in the Darjeeling district, but it, it certainly seems to me to be a specific prejudice against the Darjeeling district and the Himalayas, um, suppressing basic information that has nothing to do, has no security value at all, but they, they claim that, you know, you can't even get decent maps of the region because the Indian government claims that there's some sort of, you know, security threat as though China doesn't have everything mapped already and knows exactly what, you know, so it's just absurd and it, 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 it drives, it drives me crazy. And so, yes, good planning is based on good information. And the, the part of this project is really showing that we have to, you know, the, the, the level of the effort that we had to go through even to produce these basic findings is absurd from a resource perspective. Um, and, and, you know, we need an entire generation of trained planners and researchers in from the hills, in the hills, doing this work and able to inform good local planning. And um, that can't happen on its own. It has to, it, you know, we have to have these shared resources that come from the, the governments above. And so it's, yeah, it's absolutely absurd. And we can't do this work without better cooperation from the, the scientific organizations within India as well. Um, the second thing I would say is, is that, um, and to go to your first question about whether, you know, on, on, the, on the overall, is this a net uh, gain or, uh, or loss for low-income groups? I think that's a really difficult question to answer because again, 
you know, so much of this work is weighing short-term development. You know, conditions are really good in the hills relatively right now. There's lots of um, relatively good employment, a lot of development happening, um, interesting, um, you know, telecommunications is coming in. You have incubators of small businesses. You have some really interesting things happening there in, in terms of, of, of development and, and creating a tourism identity. The, um, all of those are, are benefits and they, they help, um, you know, they help balance against some of the, the losses in the, you know, tea plantation agricultural economy of the region. Um, at the same time, if all of that results in a major uh, disaster event that severely impacts the, the regional economy, we may look back and say that that was a mistake. So it's, it's very difficult for me to gauge. I think that the, the key point we have to make is to get out ahead of any argument that building disaster resilience is a anti-development stance, and it's really not. Um, it's meant to ensure that development we do have is safe and secure so those investments continue to provide uh, livelihoods and, and wealth um, to everyone in the society, especially those who are least well off. And so I think that that has to be the framing. Um, the worst thing we could do is get into this framing that we see here in the United States, which you know we're terrible at managing disasters, um, is that we any, any decision that goes against development, we say you have to build this way or over here or this way in order to avoid floods, gets politically framed as anti-development. And that's not the case at all. We're just trying to ensure that development is actually sustainable rather than some sort of, um, some sort of uh, temporary thing that gets washed away every time there's a flood. And I think you could make the same argument for an earthquake in Darjeeling. We need to, to learn to build in ways that are sustainable, even through the natural hazards that are part of a mountain environment. Landslides will always be there. Earthquakes will always be there. We have to build uh, resiliently, which means not building eight story concrete buildings on the side of, of slopes, which is just an absurd use of, of um, absurdly risky activity versus something that's more um, to the scale of the environment, conforming with the environment, using local materials and using local architectural techniques that have been in, in, the, in place there for thousands of years. Um, all of those, those kind of movements can help um, build much uh, a built environment that's safer and also much more to the character of the region. Um, and so uh, again, these are big ideas that are gonna take a long time to try to um, influence, but you do see glimmers of hope from a lot of the young people and the organizations there that are focusing on things like vernacular architecture and building landslides safely with vernacular architecture and materials. So I think there is reason for hope, even if it's a, it's a, a dim hope right now. Thank you. Uh, well, well, thank you. Yes, Arjun, uh, I have already question to chip in and then have your comments and all these things, questions. And, and just one thing, uh, Andrew, don't feel about the data part. It's not the hill area. It's not the sensitive area. Simply, they don't share the data. Patna is not a uh, you know, sensitive area, but uh, in order to get GIS data, you have to go through, you know, move the mountains and all. So, yeah, it's the culture. <laughs> Nevertheless. I mean, I go, I go spend days, I, you know, I try to use my American researcher, you know, privilege to go yell at bureaucrats about data. And I've not had no success. So I don't know, we need to. And then every once in a while, I talk to somebody who's like, oh yeah, I just called my IAS officer friend and they gave it to me. I just Exactly, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, going on quickly to Sunidhi. Yes, please be ready. Yeah. So hello, I'm a researcher at Tempri and I'm joining from Jamshedpur, which is in Jharkhand. So first of all, I would like to say that uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew, for talking on such a pertinent topic, especially during the time when there has been uh, complex development challenges in the Himalayan region because of the changes. So even though urbanization has created a lot of opportunities in terms of employment, socioeconomic services, et cetera, but this urban growth in the Eastern Himalayas uh, cannot be stopped or reduced. Even though city development plans and state disaster frameworks were developed, they did not make uh, any provision as such. Uh, maybe because of the deliberate ignorance of urbanization or greed and greed of the people. So how can corruption be overcome and what tools uh, in terms of education, uh, incentives, plans or behavior can be used to overcome it? Uh, in addition, I would also like your view on uh, what can be done in cities of Western Himalayas where there is a lot more urbanization as well as a lot more tourism uh, when compared to Eastern Himalayas. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Dr. Andrew, let me also add the question so that we can collect and also conclude. So, let me, let me first congratulate you 
for giving such a pertinent and also uh, giving us the view from such a beautiful images and uh, and powerpoint presentation images you shared with us uh, but uh, let me also just add that we also have this program for the hilly areas where in the central government most of our, in our federal structure uh, uh, many of the funds come by 60 to 40 ratio 75 25 ratio 50 50 also uh, but more, for most of the hilly areas we have the scheme wherein we give 90 to 10 ratio or even 100 percent centrally sponsored those things has come up but really as you have highlighted in your lecture that the demand is so much of this urban pressure i really thought to take this opportunity to discuss with all of you that uh, what is happening so between census 2011 and where we are now uh, we all are anticipating of you know this urban growth and uh, uh, i have been to a lot of places with uh, uh, alex sir uh, dr avinash father and uh, every place we go then we bet that what would be the next census turnout in terms of number of houses of you know or a household and uh, at all the instances uh, i have a very high estimate and uh, thank you for showing those imaginaries because uh, our official data, as Dr. Abhinav was also suggesting, is uh, very pessimistic for acknowledging this kind of real time, uh, I would say, uh, uh, things happening to integrate. And uh, having this, then th there is also a lot of a lag in terms of what action we, we can take. And uh, uh, I, I would really also like to add the point of vacant and rental housing, especially when we are moving to low lying areas and expanding. So there the employment and livelihood is also becoming because uh, most of these are service sector oriented as you also highlighted. And uh, there is uh, hospitality, tourism, most of those things coming. And there is a lot of seasonality in terms of employment. So how do you see this as a you know, improvement? Because then as Sunidhi also highlighted, then what levers do we have? Uh, in terms of uh, fines, penalties, or uh, as you also suggested that you just give 10,000 rupees and it's over. So this uh, business as usual scenario is also leading to a lot of rent seeking. And uh, uh, as we were also discussing in terms of land and uh, uh, disaster, in, in other cities we see in the recent case of Hyderabad also, the urban floods in Delhi, we see all the times air pollution. So uh, this climate change and this uh, uh, resilient things is coming in many dimension. And uh, I would say now we have been uh, so much used to it that it's really business as usual scenario. This pandemic has also really hit us hard, uh, especially for hills because tourism and other things are also suffering. So uh, uh, many places we also see other dynamics also happening that the circle rate going down and uh, there is also recession in the market, whatever uh, uh, or uh, uh, what so it is. So I really thought to ask you that uh, how then we envisage our institution as the point of, uh, uh, we also discussed uh, in the, in, in, at the start and uh, how do we do it fast? Because the challenge really is to uh, mitigate these things and uh, have the best practices for this sustainable development. We have smart cities. Most of the hill cities, these are also smart cities. We have ease of doing business, ease of living index, but these things are really not uh, coming forward. So what do you think in your, uh, uh, in your effective consciousness that from uh, learning from other uh, other countries or other developing regions, because you have chosen really a very good area. No one looks upon that area in Western Himalayas and other cities. Other Northeastern cities also get a lot of prominence, but not uh, that one. So what do you think that how there the urban rejuvenation should be? Because it's very easy to have a greenfield development. In our smart cities, we are also seeing most of the projects, but brownfield and fixing our uh, hills and these kind of uh, places where uh, 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 livelihood and po political economy, as Dr. Dheeraj was also mentioning, uh, of so many things is also coming upon. So how do you see the way forward and what can be the immediate steps could be uh, in two, three years uh, uh, by the time I think you should visit us and we are over this pandemic. And now we know that we fund us. Yeah, this is the first, this is the first year I've been to Darjeeling probably 20 times in the last six or seven years. I go there almost constantly and so i'm really missing it this time of year especially um the christmas time is amazing in, in darjeeling and Kalimpong. so um 
so yes, hopefully next year after um, you know Donald Trump is out of office and we have a vaccine and all these things, it'll be it'll be better. Um, so just to go to um, the first questions about corruption, I you know I think that that's one again one of those areas where I really um, you know in my work I try. I think there's too much avoidance of the question in research. And I think we need to more directly confront those questions in our research. At the same time, we need to, you know, um, we need to kind of know our local corruption, so to speak, in a way that like, you know, the issues of co corruption in, in urban and rural development in India are very well known. And I think that the issues of corruption in um, Darjeeling and the Hill, um, station cities is fairly well known as well, at least if you talk to anyone who's there and is doing research there. Um, and those can look very different from place to place and they're driven by different um, institutional uh, contexts. I, I think that, you know, developing in the context of corruption just has to be, it has to be the default, it has to be the default assumption and has to be incorporated into our work. And instead you have so much research that almost ignores it as though it's not a key factor that's influencing things. And I understand why some researchers, you know, somebody told me in Kalimpong a couple of years ago when I was there that, you know, you know, you can go say these things. If we say these things, they might, you know, give us, you know, give us the, I think he said the, the one foot haircut or something like that. Um, you know, so there's threats of violence against people who do talk too much about these issues. But I, I think that as researchers, it's really incumbent upon us um, not necessarily to try to solve issues of corruption because I don't see that as our, as our primary function, but to understand what role corruption plays in the larger um, scheme of development and, and how, um, you know, if the ultimate goal is to work towards more resilient communities, then we have to understand where fundamentally does, does issues of, of corruption potentially um, you know, threaten or pre prevent uh, that from happening. Um, and I think that goes to my response to the second question about you know, what, are, what should be the top priorities right now in terms of development. Personally, this is just my own personal opinion. Again, I, I think that um, I would much rather privilege voices from this region in terms of development priorities than my own. But I think that um, I tend to think that institutional transformations are more powerful than any kind of physical infrastructure transformations. I think that um, you know, if we had you know a thousand crore to spend, I would rather spend it on creating an entire new generation of planners and builders and developers and NGO, you know, to to help um, embody. So a development um, movement that is focused on resilience and sustainability and local, um, you know, local building practices and local people, you know, that's really a new way of thinking about development rather than some new drainage scheme or some new, um, personally, I think that that kind of soft investment is the most powerful transformational tools we have because if you have a whole generation of planners who think differently about um, ethics and think differently about how the kinds of decisions that they can make in the context of the place they're working, that can make huge changes when you add them together over the long term versus one scheme that may fall apart. Um, I would, I, one quick sort of, I don't know if it's a rejoinder, but just the issue of like, you know, the development schemes and how much they are giving to, you know, 90, 10, 100 this, it should also be mentioned that the Darjeeling district in that region is also being systematically mined for resources by the central government, including the damming of many of the important rivers there for hydropower. And so again, there's there's a, a bit of a trade-off there that, you know, I think not to get into a whole other area that I'm not at all an expert on, but some of these, um, the, the posture of the central government about the, the amount of resources that they put towards the mountain states is sometimes to me feels a little dishonest because there's these incredible large scale extractive activities that are happening also that um, don't get reflected in those numbers. And so I just, I, it just strikes me and especially seeing the transformation of the Tista over the last 10 years, but due to the damming up river um, that has really, um, that's a huge cost that's being borne by the people locally there. And um, there's not a whole lot of return to them um, as far as I can see. Um, from a development perspective. So um, anyhow, I know I'm speaking about huge issues that are beyond my, are really outside of my wheelhouse, but um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, to end on a positive note, I think there's too much pessimism also within all of this. I think there's, there's um, you know, 
uh, speaking among the small group here, but it's also being recorded. You know, I think that there's just, there needs to be, a, there's a new generation that needs to be empowered in India to, to think and act differently about places. Um, and I know that goes against many of the traditions of privileging seniority and, and experience, but there needs to be a new generation of scholars and thinkers that are um, really thinking about urban development holistically, thinking about places as important and the safety and resilience of places as important and thinking locally about how um, different theories can be translated into practice at a local level that's not so driven by development agendas or research agendas that are coming out of Calcutta and Delhi and Mumbai. And so I, I'm just, I'm really grateful that um, several local scholars are on this call and have given feedback that's um, really important to me. And I, I hope that I really commend you for that posture and that we need much more of that. We need to, to think about, or just like we do here in the US where I think we do a good job of this, we need to think about our universities as remarkable resources that are everywhere and to really rely on local expertise whenever possible. So um, the next time you organize this talk to talk about this region with one of the local researchers in the lead, I'd be very happy to be a discussant and ask questions. Sure, sure, sure. We will try to arrange a similar kind of events. But before wrapping it up, uh, just let's have some quick view from Mr. Sami Nulhale. Uh, he is the Joint Commissioner of Municipal Administration Department, Government of Maharashtra. So it's over to Mr. Nulhale uh, for your quick comments. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, the basic thinking about as to what exactly development is uh, has gone through many evolutions. And probably uh, right now, maybe for last two, two or three decades, we are now thinking about uh, <clears throat> in, in insisting and institutionalizing sustainable uh, aspects <clears throat> in all development paradigm. Probably like uh, uh, thinking uh, from a practitioner's side, from a you know real uh, brass tag administration side, one feels that you know uh, this unity of purpose at societal level that uh, the unity of uh, thinking will always be a political process because uh, we will be having various uh, elements, various aspects, groups, interest groups that uh, will be constantly interacting with the, within the society in a political uh, <clears throat> framework. And this uh, process of negotiations goes on and it may not be a very fast and quick process and this uh, equilibrium that will be brought about by various conflicting stakeholders. And as I keep on uh, saying the word which I claim to have coined, that is collective climate wisdom. This collective climate wisdom will be an emergent phenomena out of all the greed and lust and you know aspects which might be happening. <clears throat> this is a long shot. I know we may not have time for that, but ultimately we'll have to depend more and more upon the common sense of common people rather than the technocrats and the thinkers and you know elitist uh, aspect which often is seen at the development framework so uh, so many that is what i would like to really say that I, we will have to trust upon the common sense of common people that the collective climate wisdom will be emerging from this uh, in, in from the disparate and conflicting uh, opinions of maybe corporate, of government, of non-government, of academia, of think tanks and everything. And uh, that is something that we'll have to nurture and develop. And as uh, our, as Andrew said, uh, like we're looking for new thinkers, we'll also be looking for new citizens who will be more appreciative and uh, recipient of the uh, idea. And maybe as Maslow's need hierarchy was there about basic needs, probably there is also a moral uh, need hierarchy of morality in which slowly as we come together, as we evolve, as we become uh, financially and develop. So I think we have lost him. I'm sorry, I think the network issues yeah. are there. But uh, generally, I think that is what I would like to really state that uh, we need to we need to uh, allow common people to interact much more maybe a very one sided elitist uh, stance are do not connect with the common citizens and therefore there is no sufficient traction within the society for the ideas of sustainability and even for that matter climate change it is still being seen as that of uh, technocrats and common people are yet to you know, get convinced about the logic that we are trying to say so uh, in generally yes uh, i am sure that the general uh, international uh, understanding that we're having 
of maybe the Paris Accord, the climate change, the sustainable development goals. I am sure the new people are getting convinced by it, and slowly there will be a uh, there will be an evolution and development and pressure of uh, giving primacy and priority to environment sustainability than short term uh, eco economic goals. So again, I think uh, there is there are some internet issue, connectivity problems. Uh, uh, well, thank you. So I think if you want to respond to uh, any, uh, or if you have any comments to uh, Mr. Nale's observation, uh, Dr. Rambach. I just I, I agree one hundred percent. I think that um, sure, sure. development has you know it has to come from the bottom up, and and you know. Uh, researchers like us can help provide the framework for thinking and the evidence, and but movements have to start from below. And and I think movements towards resilient development in the Himalayas is going to have to start from below. Uh, so well, thank you. So I think there are uh, three broad uh, you know, takeaways which we can uh, uh, have from these uh, from today's conversation. Like first one is the linkages between the small and small towns and the surrounding rural areas have been changing a lot and therefore they needs to be studied in in a quite a great de greater detail and also there is a urgent need to make uh, sustainability a central issue in planning and managing india's urban environmental problems and perhaps most important for us to do some sort of uh, risk informed planning with the help of detailed data and most importantly such planning must be inclusionary uh, and of, of 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 all people so uh, once again on behalf of team impri uh, I uh, thank, I'm thankful to Dr. Uh, Rambach and also I'm thankful to all the panelists, all the discussions uh, for today's program. And, uh, and we hope that uh, we will be uh, having you, Dr. Rambach, in our near future events as well. So thank you, thank you once again. So Namaskar and good night from Kolkata. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew and all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr.